views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome everybody, I'm the Doc Bob Lee. We've got another fantastic show lined up for you today. This is Open BXRX, and coming up on today's show, watch out, we're gonna give it to you. I tell you, we're gonna be speaking to the, a recipient of a prestigious award that carries 36 years of history. Then we'll hear from a representative of an organization that is providing opportunities for young men and women in the world of arts. And then after that, we'll sit down with two individuals whose organizations is making a lasting impact on our youth. And then Bobby C steps into the room, kaboom! He has the latest in the world of sports. And then finally, we'll highlight the efforts of an organization that is working with our, our school leaders, officials, parents, and students. Stay tuned because we are wide open. Welcome, everybody. I'm the Doc Bob Lee. I'm your host, and uh, you're watching Open. It's that live interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. You can stay connected to us through social media at BronxNet TV. Leading things off, our first guest is the author of The Daughter of the Stone. Watch out. And she joins us today to speak about her love for fiction and to reflect on being the 2021 NYSCA NYFA Artist Fellows award recipient now please welcome to the show dama ianos figueroa welcome 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 how are you thank you i'm very well thank you and you good good now you've done a lot you've uh, between here and puerto rico what, what town in puerto rico are you from i'm from carolina oh carolina okay yes. I, I know where it is so I how did you, yeah how did you get into this how did I get into this? You mean writing in general? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I always loved writing. I always loved stories. But um, somewhere, well, I started writing in high school, but I didn't have a specific direction. I was just trying different things yeah. as a kid. I, as I got older, I started noticing that there weren't very many accurate portrayals of Puerto Ricans and forget about Afro-Puerto Ricans on the screen or in the media. Yeah. Um, and so I decided maybe I need to correct that since I was an English major and I was studying everybody else's literature. It was time for me to start looking at ours. And uh -huh. um, the first book by a Puerto Rican writer that I read was Down These Mean Streets by Piri Thomas. But it very quickly dawned on me that that was not my story, that was a story. And so I realized that there were many stories that we could tell. And so I decided to tell the one I wanted to. Yeah, and now here we are, you're a recipient, a recipient mm -hmm. of these uh, wonderful awards. Now NYSCA and NYFA stand for? Well, the New York State and New, uh, the New York State Council on the Arts and the New York Foundation for the Arts. Yep. And year, uh, yearly they award fellowships to support and encourage artists in the field. And that includes all kinds of artists. Fiction writers, uh, it's, fiction is one category. Yeah, how did you, find, how did you feel when you found out? Uh, for a while I was in shock. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was in the middle of a lot of different things, so I really didn't have time to digest it. Now that I have digested it, I'm still floating. I'm yeah. still floating. Um, and it's, and uh, it's wonderful to bring attention to the Bronx, yes. to bring attention to the creative side of the Bronx. That's good. I'm glad you're, you're doing well in your authorship. And um, I got to tell you, um, yeah, people who go through this, they have, there's an inspiration behind everything. So mm -hmm. what, 
popped into your mind or into your spirit um, saying, you know what, I need to, I need to put the pen to the paper. Well, how did it all happen for you? Well, I think one of the things that happened was when we were kids, we lived in the South Bronx and my parents sent us to Puerto Rico to stay with my grandparents mm -hmm. until they could save up enough money to buy a home. And so we were sent, we went from the Bronx, nice urban environment to rural Carolina, <laughs> you know, and the, the first day yeah, I'm looking yeah. at these cows with these swollen udders and, um, and when I, what? when I needed to use the bathroom, my grandmother directed me to the little house in the back. Um, and that was my first introduction to a latrine. And, <laughs> yeah, the owl house. Um, and as I grew up, uh, you know, those were fond memories when we got back to New York and we moved into our home. And then I went to college and became a teacher. I realized that my students didn't know anything of that world. And so I decided I need to start writing. I, I, I need to start connecting the future with the past. Yeah. So now you're doing it and uh, I'm sure, are you still teaching? I am a retired New York City teacher uh -huh. and I am a full-time writer now. Yeah. And um, you first put the paper back out and then uh, followed by the hardcover. No, first the hardcover came out. Hardcover came out first? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. usually that's the route, the hardcover yeah. and then the paperback. Okay. And um, so a great team uh, uh, led by Vivian Cote helped me put together a, a quality paperback edition mm -hmm. that, um, and I, I'll show it to you right here because I'm very proud of it. Daughters oh, of the Stone. All right, yeah. Woo. Right? It won the Indie Award, and when it came out in hardcover, it was shortlisted for a Pen Award. So right. I must have been, I figured I, I have to be doing something right. So we went yeah. ahead and, and published the paperback, and I'm glad to say it's been taught in about 22 colleges, and, um, and it's still going strong. Yeah. Now, hold up the book again. Oh, of course. And uh, open it up. And give me oh, a quick can't see much. Yeah. <laughs> can't give see me, much. Yeah. Give me a quick synopsis of what the book is about. Okay. This book is the first in a series of five books. And this book is about five generations of Afro Puerto Ricans, starting with capture in West Africa mm -hmm. and life in colonial Puerto Rico, and then migration to the United States and New York City in particular. Yeah. And when I, it came out, people said, you know, this is great, this is great, but I wanna know more about this one or I wanna know more about that one. Or, yeah. So I decided that the first one was five generations and I was going to write a book about each of the generations thereafter. So the yeah. second book in the series will be coming out. The second book is a standalone actually. It's coming out in um, April, 2022. Oh, wow. It's called A Woman of Endurance. And it takes Beautiful. a character and gives her her own life. Now, how important is, is that? Because people really don't know the history of Puerto Rico. Um, you know, because if you go to uh, Fajardo or, or Piñones, you know, you can see African Absolutely. Descent. You can travel the whole island to see the mixture. And Absolutely. People don't know that the original people, the Taino Indians, right? And, right. and then the Spaniards came and mixed with the Africans and the Puerto Rican, the Puerto Rican is three people. Right. Trinity. Yeah. And then we we're yeah. born. Um, absolutely. And when Daughters of the Stone came out, people wanted to know why isn't it in Spanish? You know, people on yeah. the island wanted to read it. And so I'm very happy that A Woman of Endurance is going to be published in an English and a Spanish edition. So everyone can read it. Beautiful. And it will be published by HarperCollins, the Amistad right. imprint under yeah. HarperCollins. And I am so excited about it coming out and introducing people into my world. Perfect. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, yes. And I'm sure, do you, what about audio books? Is that in the works? Um, I think it's one thing at a time. So they put out yeah. this, this, these two. And uh, certainly there is 
an opportunity for audio and digital and all the different other formats that yeah. um, that um, novels can take. Yeah. Where can we get your your information? Are you on uh, social media on the Absolutely. web? Absolutely. Uh, if you go to dalmaganosfigueroa.com, that is my uh -huh. website. Yes. And all the information you need is there, including if you want to buy the book from the website, you can do that. Uh, or it lists a number of retailers. Um, wonderful independent bookstores as well will get the book for you or may even have the book already. And so going to the website will give you all the information. If you'd like to be on my mailing list so you can get my newsletter, you can do so from the website. Yeah. And then you can keep track of where I am and where I'm reading and what events I'm having, et cetera. Yeah. Perfect. Dama, thank you so much and congratulations once again. And uh, we continue to uh, praise you and good luck with everything. Thank you so much. I have right. a lot to thank our community that has always supported me as well as the African-American community and the community at large. I have to thank my readers, all of them for um, this success. You don't get here by yourself. There you go. Fantastic author, Dama Janos Figueroa. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Bob. You're welcome. Dama, we're gonna take a quick break right here, but wait, I've got more. Keep it up next okay. on Open. Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Doc Bob Lee, and our next guest is an art therapist and clinical program associate at the Animation Project. She's here today to speak about the beneficial animation programs available for New York City youth. Please welcome to the show, Nala Turner. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Good. Tell us about this. When, when did you start this? Um, I personally joined uh, the Animation Project about two years ago. Uh -huh. um, and the animation project itself has been um, in session since 2008. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself and the role that you play at the animation project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, I am a lead creative arts therapist and a clinical program associate at the animation project. I co-facilitate our therapeutic workforce development animation groups and uh -huh. carry out individual one-on-one -on -one, um, sort of therapy and support with our young animators at TAP as well. Yeah. Now, when you talk about the um, therapeutic workforce and, and, and what you are, the title that you are, what is that all about? What do you have to do? Absolutely. Um, at TAP is 
a place where we bring um, both therapy and workforce development together. And so uh-huh. we're an organization that values the influence of well-being within professional growth. And so um, thinking about progressing in the working fields and knowing obviously our lives, our personal lives come into work and how is it that we can handle that? And so um, we specifically choose to serve populations that are underserved, yet rich in creative power and, and needing that. And you have a number of educational programs, right? Like the animation project. What, what does it provide? Yeah, for sure. Um, within our programming, we provide many different types of programming. Um, Prior to COVID, obviously we were uh, solely in person. And so um, we were running programming um, that is um, going from incentivized programming, small groups within multiple different um, locations like schools, probation sites, community organizations, detention centers, um, and and some. And now of course we are online and we are virtual. So um, the really cool thing about TAP is that we have a very flexible model and we are able to sort of fit into many different um, spaces and avenues. Yeah, I know, um, you know, when you run into all those programs, you got to lace up your, your sneakers or your shoes and uh, just hit the pavement. Um, <clears throat> but with COVID, uh, the, how did the pandemic, uh, everything went virtual from then, I guess, right? Yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's multiple levels to our programming. And so it's designed to sort of guide uh, the youth within our programming throughout these multiple levels. So they start in these incentivized level-based groups, perhaps in their school or in a community organization. They then have the opportunity to keep learning those skills, honing in those skills and make their way to what we call our internship program, which is a stipend paid internship to hope to then get placed into um, actually a job or perhaps another internship opportunity. And so we actually just recently graduated over 30 interns and 17 of them are placed this year. All right. Congratulations. And thank, thank you guys you. for the work that you're doing. Uh, why is it important for these programs uh, to put in place for these youngsters? Yeah, um, I think what's important uh, to me, especially, is that, you know, it's important to empower young people to become economically independent and productive. I think that with good technical skills and a secure some emotional well-being, you are able yeah. to actually um be able to express yourself and successfully enter a creative field like the animation. And so pairing that professional development with creative arts therapy is what makes TAP program work in particular. Nala, what do you have coming up? Anything that we can uh, jump into and uh, check out? Yeah, um, we are currently um, working on our fall programming. Fall programming will be starting really, really soon. You will hear from us. um, If you do not already, you can find us on our website. And of course, you can connect with us on our social media. Um, We we are hoping to be back in person very soon. So if you are out there looking for us, we are coming to find you. Also wanted to say if you're interested in connecting (laughs) with us, if you haven't, yeah, right, exactly. If you are interested in connecting with us, um, but you haven't been able to figure out a way to contact us, you can always email us as well at info at the animation Yeah. What does that fall programming look like? What our fall expect? programming? Yeah, our, our fall programming um, right now is still being panned out, but usually it is the um, group animation. So we have um, kids from all over the boroughs coming together and creating an animation together. Oh, that's great. So explain that, break it down. If we have some parents listening who are interested in getting their child involved or or some youngsters listening, Mm -hmm. explain that, just break it down to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So if they were in school, they would come into school. Perhaps if we were um, partnered with a school, it might be set up as a class for them, or maybe it's something that is an after school programming. We come Mm -hmm. with our computers um, and a professional animator and a creative arts therapist like myself come as a team. And together we work with the kids, teaching them 3D animation skills. They are learning animation skills that are industry standard. So you are actually learning um, Autodesk Maya and 3DS Max, the actual programs that are used for animations that you go see in the films and in the theaters every day. Um, So they're learning those skills and actually creating on their own. Who does the voice to a lot of that stuff? A lot of them are them. That's the really <laughs> cool thing um, about animation. They're learning about the entire pipeline, right? Starting yeah. all the way from the beginning, storyboarding all the way to the end, post effects, visual effects, and sound. So that's, that's great. really great. They get to do it as well. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Where can we go uh, and find out more information about all the wonderful things that you all, you guys are doing? Now? Of course, on our website, www.theanimationproject.org. 
Um, you can always email us at info at the And follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Watch our films. Yes, I think that's all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you for all the wonderful information. And thank you for your service. Thank you so much for having me. Nala Turner, art therapist and clinical program associate. It's the animation project. Don't, don't tell anybody. Keep it to yourself. The animation project. No, you can let anybody know. It's on and popping at the animation project. Nala, I, so, see? Nala, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we're going to take a break right here, but we'll come back with more. You going to watch? Yeah. All right, here we go. Next on Open. <laughs> When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Doc Bob Lee from BLS. Our next guest are the executive director and the deputy executive director of Claremont Neighborhood Centers Incorporated. And they're with us today to highlight the work that they're doing, the organization is doing to provide uh, enriching experiences for our youth. So please welcome to the show, Abraham Jones Jr. and Christopher Wilson. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? We're doing fine. We're doing great. We're doing great. Good, good. All right. Where are you guys uh, situated right now? Uh, well, we, we're, we're here at Claremont Neighborhood Centers at 489 uh, East 169th Street, in the Bronx, yeah. in 3rd Washington Avenue. Tell us about the programs over there and what you guys are offering our community. Well, I, I want to say that um, we recognized last year uh, during the crisis uh, the need to have uh, viable, safe, a child care. And so during the uh, pandemic, during the crisis, we never closed our doors. We Beautiful. Doors. We provided child care for those families and essential workers. Uh, and so uh, we developed some protocols uh, to, around COVID and we implemented those and uh, we kept our doors open, serving families who needed to go to work. You know, you're no stranger to our community. You've been helping our community for, for many years now, right? Yeah, again, it's about the needs of the community. The need was there. The need was there. Uh, and so because the need was there, then we responded to the needs. I try to teach my staff and train my staff that our job is just to be responsive to the needs of the community. 
So I'm not, it's not about what we want or what we need, but what the community needs. And we're going to be true community servants. So yeah, you go way back to the, the learning tree. Yeah. Yeah. Lois <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gregory. That's Lois Gregory. You know, send them my regards, okay? I certainly um, will. How long have you guys been working with the organization now? I've, I've been I've been uh, with Claremont for uh, going on 17 years. Uh, uh, when the previous executive director, well, I was I was on the board of directors prior, prior to that, and then when the previous yeah. executive finally passed away, um, the board had, had requested that I consider coming on board since I was most familiar with the organization, and so I did. Uh, and now I've been working here for about five years. Uh, Mr. 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 Wilson here, uh, who um, I, I, I'm I'm considering retiring. <laughs> so you're gonna hand off? You're gonna hand it off? <laughs> no. <laughs> Mr. Wilson, who, who I've known since he was like 12 years old. Hello. Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> so, Christopher, so, are you ready for this? Are we ready uh, for the hand off? You know, it's it's it's. It's a it's an easy question to answer, um, but you know I grew up in this community, um, and I love what I do. I love working with young people. You know I always tell people when I went away to college um, to study uh, sociology and, and social work, I said, you know I want to come back here, and this is my protest to work here in my community and to give back to come out my community and provide programming for the young people in my community where I grew up at. Because I know yeah. what I didn't have when when I was when I was growing up here. Yeah. What would you do different if you were in charge? You don't have to wait until you're in charge now. You can initiate the program. Oh, well, you know what? I think, I think, I think, I think a, a lot of the things that, one of the things that we've been able to do is upgrade, I'll say, like our technology. You know, this past year, we had a program, uh, the Learning Labs, in which we were funded through DYCD. And yeah. uh, we purchased laptops for, uh, for young people who were in our programs where parents didn't feel safe in sending them uh, into the schools. They came here, we had laptops for them and they were able to get on, access their classes. We were able to provide support for them. And so they were able to do the schoolwork here all year long um, in a safe environment. So that's just one of the things that I've you know, been able to do here at Claremont. And you got the broadband service there to, yes. to, to help that along, yeah. You know, yeah. A lot of people don't have broadband service, you know? So that's that's a good thing. So you can, you can probably expand that uh, yeah. and, and it's probably going to be a lot of funds for that also. The government funds are coming for a lot of that stuff. Yeah, so, one, yeah. one, one, that, I'm glad you brought that out because, you know, we are on a night of development. And one of the issues was um, uh, families living at home did not have access to the internet in any real uh, sustainable way. And so because one of the things we took did was make sure that we upgraded everything here at Claremont uh, technology-wise, in terms of the internet access on every floor and every classroom, you know, routers all over the place, uh, so that the kids, when they come here, they would actually be able to get on, uh, get on the classes and and, uh, and and be able to get the work done and not have any interference. Abraham, you're not thinking about retiring now, are you? <laughs> this, this, this has been, a, this has been I, a... you brought it up. You said you know, he's going to be the man to go to, the go-to this... guy when I. When this, this, ball. this has been a five-year process already. So I <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm semi-retired. Yeah, yeah. Semi-retired. So I mean, I, 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 want, I want to let go of some things. I'm going to still be involved, but I want to pick a choose. Yeah. I want him to be my boss. There you go. <laughs> you know it. It's, it's funny what a lot of people don't know is, you know, Mr. Jones, it, it, it's so funny. Sometimes he'll call me and he'll have something to say to me and I would have already thought about it. And he said, we think too much alike. And it's just a part of just me being under Mr. Jones and just learning so much from Mr. Jones. You know, I started working with Mr. Jones when I was, I was an SYP worker. Uh -huh. I was some of I was about what, 14, 14 years old, 14 years old. Yeah. Uh, I, worked, so, I, worked, I worked in a family support system with Brenda Hart, and uh, and uh, and I had him there as a summer youth worker for about four years. Yeah, uh, that's you guys are blessed. This you know you guys 
you got a little harmony going on. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. 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 What impact are you having in the in the Bronx community there? Are people coming back and saying, hey, man, thank you very much for providing this look. I'm doing this now because you guys have helped me reach this sort of level. I, I think the impact we have is we're bringing about real change. I think people know that they have a safe place. It's more, more, most important to have a safe place where their children can go. Yeah. Uh, we, we didn't get funding last year, but we got funding this year that we have a night program. We're open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, seven days a week. Yeah. We open for, for seven days. We'll, we literally will be open until September 3rd every single day. And so yeah. With that program, our teens and night program is really to keep the kids off the street. They have a safe place to come. We have a ton of activities here. We have a game room. We have a team lounge. We have dance. We have arts. We have basketball. We have tournaments. We do trips and family outings. But it's really to create the, the space, where, especially because there's so much violence going on. It's always violence. There's always been violence, but I mean, particularly now, and so yeah. have a, the, the young people can come. And, and be young and be young people and parents don't have to worry about about their safety so the yeah. impact, those kinds of those kinds of things impact the community because they have a, a feeling of uh, feeling more safe in their community more safe in the programs that are there offered for the children and i think that's critically important for families to know that their kids are able to go somewhere absolutely they have trained folks folks that people really care Caring folks. Yeah. We work with yeah. our families. I mean, we, our families come from uh, it's, it's, it's a, a myriad of backgrounds and yeah. really provide the, the, the support. One of the, one of the things we've been pushing out to our families who, who come here, because uh, we, we have a small summer camp, it's a fee based program. And so now with Governor Cuomo releasing the Essential Workers Scholarship Program, right. we've been reaching out to all of our parents saying, listen, it is an opportunity that you have sent essential workers to apply for the scholarship. And guess what? When you apply for the scholarship, you are notified within a minute whether or not you've been accepted Ooh, or not. Yeah. Then to, to get your kids in a program, you can find, it doesn't have to be here. It could be any fee for service program that you want, whether it's dance, whether it's music, whether it's somewhere in the Bronx or in New York City, find a program, apply for the scholarship and, and, and get your kids in a program. And yeah. so we kind of, we kind of, we're the voice, that kind of voice that we want to be for parents, uh, provide that kind of advocacy, you know? And so I mean, it's yeah. so much. And so Mr. Wilson can speak about mm -hmm. some of our other uh, programs that we do, uh, uh, our summarizing program. Yeah. Is it is this posted up? Is it posted up on the uh, on the internet? You have a website? What is that? You have a website where people can go and uh and, and check it out and find out more about what you're doing? Oh yeah, yeah, we have yeah, we, we have we have we have a website. That, that's the other that's the other area that Mr. Wilson is working on. So, tell us about what you have posted. Tell us well. Tell us where we can go to, to check out more because they're going to give me a, a hard wrap. So here. definitely, we have a we have an Instagram. It's called We Are uh, We Are CNC. Uh, we post a lot of our updates of our programs and, and stuff that we have offered our times and stuff. Uh, you're able to go in and you can see the work that we do in the schools or with our kids. There's videos, tons of stuff, tons of stuff up there. Um, our website, right. we really, you know, we are currently working on our, our website, but if you want to see the most accurate stuff of what's going on, you can go to our Instagram page of We Are CNC. There you go. Abraham Jones Jr. and Christopher Wilson the Deputy Executive Director, and of course, the Executive Director, Mr. Jones. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the uh, uh, BronxNet uh, Open Show, all right? And if you guys are into sports, I've got a whole lot. Coming up next, check this out. Coming up next, Bobby C. has the latest in the world of sports. Next.
It's an absolute honor to welcome John Harrington to the show this morning. Number 28 on arguably the greatest hockey team of all time, the 1980 USA Olympic team, the Miracle on Ice. John, good morning. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. It's a great day in Minnesota and uh, happy to be with you here today and, and talking a little bit of 1980 hockey. So awesome to have you here on the show. I'm about to make us both feel very old this morning because I'm not sure how many times you've been interviewed by a sportscaster that was actually born on the day that you guys ended up being the Miracle on Ice team. But you're talking to one right now. I was born on February 22nd, oh, 1980. Nice. All right. It was a big day. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I can't believe that I'm 41. Can you believe that it's been 41 years since that very special moment? Well, it's it's crazy, you know, to think that and and uh, and when it happened and, uh, you know, but the, the great thing is, I'll just say is that, that we've had, uh, you know, so many people still be interested in it, get more interested in you know, the movie Miracle came out and a whole new generation got interested in what happened in 1980. I mean, here I am, I'm coaching women's hockey at Minnesota State University and I'm recruiting them players that, that their teams watch Miracle and they're going to games. That's their, that's their pump up uh, movie, you know, to watch and night before games. And it, it's amazing to think that it happened 40 some years ago. I tell people that when I look at them, I said, yeah, but remember I was only five when I played on that team. So I'm only, I'm not that old. So but <laughs> it's, it's amazing how fast time has gone by. Oh, absolutely. You know, and you mentioned achievements in your career. So, you know, you went on to play at the next level. And then, as you mentioned today, you're coaching the women at Minnesota State. You've won championships as a coach at the college level. You've taken teams to the NCAA Frozen Four. Of all of those amazing accomplishments, does Miracle have its own place? It was something when you look at when you're there and you, you knew the excitement of it. And we kind of sensed what was happening as that went on as we got closer and, 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 and we're gaining confidence in our game and, and the ability to do that. And I think, you know, really for to being in Lake, in Lake Placid, I think, and not seeing television and not reading newspapers or not seeing what everybody felt about that, how much it meant to them. I think a lot of us, if not all of us found out about that after we, we went home or we went to our next thing. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like, everybody wants to see you. Everybody wants to talk to you. Uh, they want to have the team together. They want to relive what happened there. And you're going, holy smokes, this, this was big. This was a big deal. And uh, certainly, yes, the most exciting thing that's happened to me in my hockey career to be with that group and to have that success. And, uh, and again, like I say, it's, it's what we found out, I think, afterwards and how everybody had responded to it and what it meant to them and what it meant to our country. I think uh, it certainly was, was uh, it was a humbling, it was humbling. It was exciting for us, but it was humbling. You talk about like a little bit of hockey trivia here. I mean, you had the assist on Micah Runzioni's game-winning goal against Russia. Where does that moment for you rank in your career? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's probably right up there. You know, it was, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's funny in that game, I, I had taken a penalty earlier in that game and, uh, and uh, Soviet Union had scored on the power play to take the lead. And then uh, uh, I hate to bring this up that I had a breakaway after that and I missed the net. I shot and I missed the net. And of course, everybody on the team always reminds me of that, that I had a chance to score and I missed the net on that. So I'll tell you what, I, there was times on the bench going like thinking, hey, I got us behind here and I had a chance to tie it or get us back in the game with that chance that it didn't work out. But uh, on the winning goal, yeah, it was, uh, I just went in on the four check there and got it up the boards to Mark Pavlich and Bud Schneider, our other line mate had been changing and Mike came on and kind of came down the slot and Mike, that's what he did. I mean, that's what he did. He was, he was a big moment player. He'd always been a big moment player uh, in, in his college career and everything else. And, and he finished. So I always say I was right alongside the net there, you know, and I, I don't know, it might've hit my stick. I'm not sure. And, and tipped in, but I let Mike, you know, I let Mike be the game winning goal scorer. There's so. that's a good teammate. <laughs> yeah. So, John, the team has gotten together for many anniversaries over the years. The latest is a really cool one, and it's actually called Four, as in golf, F-O-R-E, a miracle golf tourney of fundraisers celebrating the 80 USA hockey team. And proceeds for this event, which is coming up, uh, is supporting a monument, actually, that will be commemorating the miracle on ice. Tell us a little bit more about this event. There's a um, uh, nonprofit 
organization in, you know, in Lake Placid that, that put together this thing and got an architect to design a monument, a bronze monument of our celebration, our victory stand celebration at the, at the Olympics. I think everybody's seen that after the medal ceremony when we all got up on that victory stand and, and, uh, and uh, he created a statue and, you know, they, that's something to commemorate uh, our victory there and to, to be in front of the building as you walk into the Lake Placid arena. And uh, we, we, we thought it's a tremendous idea. I know it's, it's, it's not about us, but we're willing to help our Olympic team. So yeah, Monday we'll be having this fundraiser golf tournament. We hope to have others in different parts of the country, but our first one here is going to be in Mystic Lake in uh, near uh, in the suburbs of Minneapolis. And uh, we've got, you know, 15 of our guys coming to the coming there and they're going to be with the, with the different uh, uh, groups out on the course playing golf with them. We have uh, three staff members that'll be there. Uh, also have Ryan Suter who plays for the, Minnesota Wild and Bob Suter's son, who we lost, unfortunately, in 2012. He'll be there. Danny Brooks, Herb's son, uh, will be there too as well. So it's a chance for us to get together and, and, and help generate interest. And Lake Placid is such a special place. You know, I, I think to be able to have something like this is uh, pretty spectacular. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those places you go back. I think other hockey players have probably said this, where you, you could walk into buildings, into certain buildings and be blindfolded, you know, but just by the smell and the feel, you'd know where you are. And I know that's the way I have always been when I've gone out to Lake Placid. I mean, you come into the town and it hasn't changed much since 1980, but you get into the arena and you get there and you just, again, you just look around and kind of, kind of take the look around the arena and you go, yeah, I, I, this, this brings back everything to me and it's exciting. And if people go there and they visit or whether they go there and they're playing in a tournament or anything else, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a monument to something really successful. And we wanted to add to that to make it even more appealing for people to visit. John, in terms of your personal career, I actually think nicknames are such a big part of your story. Your little brother gave you one that has stuck to this day. And, and actually, the line that you played on on that 80 team has a nickname that lives on forever. Tell us about both of those. Yeah, well, my, my nickname was, uh, was Ba. My nickname, B-A-H. And uh, I, I think, uh, actually, my dad uh, gave that to me. When I was, I was born, I think uh, the expression for it is Irish twins. My brother was born in July, and I was born the following May. So I mean, my brother's only 10 months older than me. Well, when I was a baby and he was learning to talk, uh, he, he wanted to say baby, but he could only say ba or baba. And my dad started calling me ba. I mean, I have a picture of my mom feeding me with a bottle when I was two months old. And my dad would always write on the back uh, what, what was going on. And he said, mom feeding ba uh, in, in the big chair or whatever. So I got that. And I know that's all I ever was in Virginia. I was ba. Uh, when I went to college, I, I think a lot of people thought my nickname, my name was Bob because everybody called me Ba. And I'm, I, I don't know, it's just always more of a Ba than a John to everybody. So my friends all still call me that. And, you know, if it's like, hey, John Harrington, oh, oh you mean Ba? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. So it's been a nickname that stuck a long time. Uh, Bob is not a bad name, by the way, John. No, right, right. <laughs> Whoops. But uh, anyway, our line, you know, the, the Coneheads, we became the Coneheads. And um, that was a funny thing. I think uh, I really remember it starting in practice. Uh, we were in practice and when, when Herb Brooks would be running the power play, I mean, he'd have Mark Johnson, of course, it's like Mark Johnson. Okay. You take your group down there and Neil Broughton, you take your group down at the other end of the rink and Pavlich, you guys, you guys just stay in the middle of the ice here. And and uh, we would just be in the middle of the ice monkeying around while they were working the power plays at both ends. And I remember Mark Pavlich saying, uh, you know, we, we might as well be cones out here. I mean, we don't get the play when they're doing the power play. We might as well be cones. Well, of course, the cone heads were big on Saturday Night Live at the time. And some of the guys picked up on that. And all of a sudden, yeah, you guys are the cone heads. That was part one of our interview with John Harrington. We'll talk more Miracle in part two next Monday morning. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. 
Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at bronxnet.tv. Learn, engage, inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> when taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee, and our next guest is a parent, community, and outreach director for the United Federation of Teachers. He's with us to speak about how the organization has continued working with our school officials to ensure child safety at schools begin to reopen. You know, everybody's worried about that. So please welcome to the show, Nick Cruz. How are you, Nick? Our award-winning Nikki Cruz, yes. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bob Lee, for, for having us back. Uh, uh, as, as before, I'm a huge fan and, and I appreciate uh, sharing, sharing this space with you, sir. Uh, and on behalf of, of uh, the UFT president, Michael Mulgrew, uh, all of our staff and vice presidents, you know, we, we appreciate this opportunity to yeah, spread, spread uh, what we've been doing during this pandemic uh, uh, with regards to our brave anti-bullying program. Yeah, and give Anthony Harmon a big handshake for me, too. Will do, will do. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you're, we said award winner because you are honoree for the, uh, the Make the Great Awards, the 2020 Make the Great Awards. So once again, congratulations to you. Thank you, thank you. That was, again, you know, a first, right? Uh, yeah. uh, winning that award uh, uh, through the pandemic, uh, uh, meeting you for the first time, all these things happened, yeah. uh, uh, and, you know, we have not stopped. And we got a chance to raise over a half a million dollars to uh, give to shelters. And uh, that was a big project there. Through our We Feed uh, NYC program uh, with the aforementioned Mr. Harmon, who was the brainchild of, of this just uh, spectacular and on time uh, uh, event, right? Uh, we were able to raise, like you said, over, I, I believe, over 300,000. And we're still. <laughs> Uh, in the process of uh, disseminating those those funds to to just uh, uh, just spectacular uh, uh, shelters that are doing great work, great community work, feeding uh, uh, families and, and just clothing families as well. So so great work done by all. And looking forward to doing that again with the the United Federation of Teachers. Uh, and if, I, about this. if I could just mention, sir, and I and I'm sorry to interrupt. But no, go ahead. The, the hostess with the mostest was uh, 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 none other than Dr. Bob Lee. And, and I think, you know, and not just saying this, sir, but you, you provided uh, the, the ease and the calm uh, to which uh, the success of that program uh, deserved. So I, I, appreciate, I appreciate you being there for that. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Nick, tell us about this wonderful program. I see the poster in back of you. You see it at different schools. It says Brave. Tell us about what it stands for and what it's all about. So our brave, our brave program, and I appreciate I appreciate the uh, the, the support uh, that you've given uh, to, through your Make the Grave Foundation, uh, uh, given this some 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 platform. Uh, the Brave, which stands for Building Respect and Voice Through Education, yeah. Building Respect and Voice Through Education. Uh, our program has been in motion, in, in, in process uh, uh, for about 11 years going on. Um, and um, what we've been able to do is just provide an array of uh, different presentations, tips, uh, resources for families, educators, and students, right? So that they can understand where to get the resources and where to get the help uh, uh, if needed. Yeah, that's great. And um, it's posted up in different schools. What can people learn from that program? So listen, uh, 
first of all, we, through the pandemic, we uh, were able to uh, put together a chat space so that parents, victims, bullies themselves, if they feel like uh, uh, they need some, someone to talk to, can find safe, confidential space where they can speak to someone, yeah. speak to someone about their family member without any uh, uh, recourse or action being taken against them, right? Um, this is, again, for undocumented folks that feel that they need someone to talk to. This is a safe space for them. They could text the BRAVE, B-R-A-V-E, to the number 43961. Text the number BRAVE to the number 43961 to find out more about resources and how to get help for folks that are suffering from, especially now with the pandemic, uh, suffering from mental anguish uh, uh, due to loss of jobs. Uh, all of these things trigger uh, a, a response. We have kindergartens uh, uh, through grade three that act out, right? And without having the, the, the proper uh, uh, know-how to kind of speak out, they act out and, and the bullying uh, uh, hotline, the program is there to help uh, uh, guide parents and, 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 and students uh, to, to just a, a safer space uh, where they could you know, just talk to folks and, and, and feel comfortable about things. So you text BRAVE at 43961. Text, in, text BRAVE to 43961 uh, and immediately uh, there's, there's, there'll be a counselor, therapist there to, to, to you know, uh, just guide you, ask you questions, uh, and again, can't stress this enough. It is totally confidential. Uh, yeah. your, your conversation with, with the therapist that answers is, is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Hey, Nikki, everybody's talking about uh, going back to school. Some people are worried. Parents are talking about it. Uh, teachers are talking about it. Principals are talking about it. Um, what's the deal? How do we, uh, are we properly prepared to, to open up fully? And what's sure. the... Uh, What's the position of the United Federation of Teachers on that? We, we want our kids back in school, right? I mean, that's, that's, we feel like that's the best uh, form of them continuing their education, not falling behind. Uh, so we are doing all that we can to, to uh, uh, make sure that the schools are safe, that our seven point plan is in place in terms of making sure that if PEP, PEP is needed. Uh, two years ago, if you said PEP, folks would think, what, what are you talking about? But we've been so inundated with this pandemic that we know what those PEPs stand for. And we, right, so, so in case those are needed at schools, they're there. Proper ventilations at schools are there. We're trying to make sure that families understand that educators, uh, cafeteria workers, uh, security agents, safety agents, they're all training to make sure that we welcome our students, our teachers, and our parents back into our schools in a safe and proper manner. And look, our president has been clear. If, if, if the schools are not safe, we will take a course of action that, pr that primarily goes towards uh, uh, safety in the school and safety in our communities. Where can we go for more information before they, they wrap me up here? I need to get that in there. So, Should we so go to the website? UFT.org, uh, uh, www.UFT.org to find out all the information, the, the, uh, um, our anti-bullying information, sorry. And again, uh, uh, before they, cra they, they crash me off, <laughs> text BRAVE, B-R-A-V-E, to 43961, uh, and let's find some, some uh, resources for our young folks. There you go. The Air Force, the Air Force pilot, <laughs> the retired <laughs> Air Force pilot, Nick Cruz, thank you so much. I appreciate you, sir. Yes. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Give a hug to everybody for me, and uh, we'll catch you another day, another way, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, your crew, and, and uh, we appreciate you. You got it.
Thank you so much, everybody. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's show. But thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't thank you enough for all of us here at BronxNet. We appreciate you and thank you for all the work that you do. And always remember this, what you are is God's gift to you and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice. Let your choice control the chooser. For all of us here, once again at BronxNet, have a great and enjoyable day. And I'll catch you on the radio on 107.5 WBLS of the Dr. Bob Lee. Love you all. Peace. 